All right. Good morning, church. Uh, Open up your Bibles with me to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3. It is uh, such an honor uh, to be here with you. Um, In addition to all those uh, wonderfully kind things that Pastor Joe just mentioned, um, I'm also uh, near and dear friends with uh, Pastor Neil. Um, and uh, to, to honor him today, many of the, the points will be alliteration. Um, so I, 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 want, I wanted you to feel very at home. Um, so I did my best. I couldn't, I couldn't quite uh, uh, keep up with him, but uh, no one I've ever met can. Um, so it is what it is. Um, but uh, Neil and I had the privilege of uh, doing a uh, Greece and Tur- Turkey tour. That's hard to say. Um, and while there, um, I, I was talking with Neil, and I saw the shirt he had, and I go, man, Neil, that shirt is amazing. You guys do such a great job uh, there at Coastline. Um, he's like, oh, thanks, man. He's like, I got to get you one. He's like, you know what? I'm going to do one better. I'm going to have you come and teach for me, and I'm going to give you that shirt. Um, great. I'm like, this, that's awesome, man. I would love to do it. So uh, he gets it on the schedule, and it would, it's almost as if it was planned. Um, not, not by me so much as by the Lord, um, because here we are uh, packing to come on this trip, and, and I had the shirt that I was going to teach with um, on, on the side, which it shouldn't have been on the side. It should have been in the suitcase, um, but it was on the side. And so we get here, and uh, the, last night I'm looking through my bag, and I'm like, I don't have a shirt to teach in. All I have is T-shirts. Like, I like shorts, T-shirts, sandals. Like, that's more, more my, my vibe. So I have a T-shirt. Um, and, and I felt it was a little disrespectful to, to come into a, a guest service with just a T-shirt on. Um, and so we get here, and Pastor Joe's like, it's all good. Neil has a shirt for you in the back. I'm like, the shirt! I forgot about the shirt. So this is, this is now the shirt, and so this is what we got. Um, the Lord is in the details. <clears throat> All right, well, guys, it is, it is such a privilege to be here, um, such a privilege to fill this pulpit that has been so faithful for so many years with Pastor John and Pastor Neil teaching the Word of God. Um, so without further ado, let's pray. Um, and we will get into our Bible study this morning. Father, we thank you so much uh, for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, that you are alive and active. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you use all things. You use uh, the simple things, like someone forgetting a shirt. Um, But Lord, we also know that you use the incredibly difficult things, and you use them for your glory. And so, Lord, we pray that this morning would be no different, regardless of what we're facing, uh, regardless of what we're, we're going through right now. Lord, we know that you can move. We know that you can speak. We know that you can settle hearts. And so, Lord, I pray that's exactly what would happen. As we open up your word, we pray that it would have a piercing effect in our life. Uh, We pray, Jesus, that it would bring comfort to those who need comfort. We pray that it would bring guidance to those who are lost. We pray, Lord, that it would even bring conviction to those who are in sin. Jesus, we pray that your word would do what only your word can. We ask, Jesus, that no one would come here and be impressed by, by an organization, impressed by the structure of ministry, impressed by the buildings, but everyone would come here impressed by you that you would speak, that you would move, that you would be present, that you would anoint this time. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. We love you so much, and it's your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're in Proverbs chapter 3, and it's not where you would think, 5 and 6. No, we're going to actually be in verses 17 all the way down to 26. Now, before we start, um, you need to know that Solomon, in writing this chapter, is giving us a list of benefits of wisdom. Um, And I can think of almost nothing more practical than the book of Proverbs. And I love how in the practical application of Proverbs, Solomon over and over again says, hey, if you live this way, you will be blessed in living this way. And so we're going to start in verse 17, but I want to back up to verse 13 so you can see the list begin. The first benefit, he says in verse 13, happy. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. So the first benefit of wisdom is happiness, a blessed life. Second, he says, for her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies. 
And all the things that you may desire cannot compare with her. The second benefit is the possession of the chief blessing. The thing that's better than all the things the world wants. The world wants the gold. They want the silver. They want the rubies. They want the wealth. But Solomon says, no, wisdom is far better. Wisdom trumps wealth. You're welcome, Neil. Verse 16. Length of days is in her right hand, and her left hand riches and honor. The third blessing is length of days, and we'll see a little bit as to why today. And then the fourth blessing is riches and honor. And if you want to know what that's about, you can download Reach Jack's app um, and go back to my teaching on it and see it. But I promise you, and that was not a shameless plug. Yeah, it kind of was. But regardless, you can, you can go back, listen to this, you can uh, uh, do some research in it, but I promise you it is not prosperity garbage or prosperity gospel um, that exists today. Um, All right, we pick up now for our context, verse 17, we find the fifth benefit of wisdom. It says, her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. Benefit number five, but for our context, benefit number one, pleasantness. Now, the word pleasant can also mean kindness, can mean delightfulness, beauty, in favor. So in short, if you're taking notes, you can say pleasantness is a life that enjoys life. It's a life that enjoys life. And it does so in many ways. First, it's one that embraces the favor of God. It enjoys life by simply embracing God's favor. Now, you know that God's favor as a believer is always available to us. It just often comes in forms that we aren't interested in. We'll pray, Lord, I'm struggling financially. I need you to pay the bills. And he goes, okay, I got you. I will, over the course of years, give you patience. I'm like, that's that's not what I asked for, right? Like, I I need the bills paid. He's like, right, right, right. I'm working on it. Uh, we, We want the disease eradicated, not endurance. Or we want patience and endurance, but we just want them right now. Right? Like, God, I, I want patience. Give it to me now. It's microwave society, baby. Like, we, we want it on tap. That's not how God's favor works. It works in a way that he gets all the glory. And for that to happen, his favor is often seen in ways that the world simply cannot duplicate. That is to leave no question as to the source of the blessing. An example would simply be peace during life-threatening circumstances. We have a lady at our church. She stands about yay high, but she's a giant in the faith. Um, she's had cancer many times. Uh, I mean, four or five bouts with cancer. And recently, um, she was meeting with the oncologist, and he said to her, Brenda, I'm sorry to tell you, but your cancer is back. And Brenda uh, tells me her reaction was, yes! And he went, no, 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 Brenda, your cancer is back. She goes, I know, but I'm so happy because... Now I get to go and talk to the chemo patients about Jesus because now that I don't have cancer, you guys don't let me back in there. But, but if I have it, I can get in there and I can share with them the, the glorious good news of the gospel. And he looks at her and he says, Brenda, you're strange, right? <laughs> she has a peace that supersedes what she is currently going through. By the way, her cancer is in remission again. Um, Peace during life-threatening circumstances. Trust in him even though everything seems to be moving in the opposite direction. We live in a world that is moving the opposite direction of the things of the Lord. And yet, we can have peace. We can rest in him as we'll see later. Or even, even his favor when there's success with zero reason for success. I think of Joseph, right? You, you don't go from the prison to the palace overnight. You don't go uh, from slavery to second in command, unless, of course, it's the Lord's favor. See, God always does things different than the world. That way, again, there's no question he gets full credit. In fact, Paul even tells us, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29, where Paul writes, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh. By the way, he's describing Christians, so I want you to to hear, like we, we hear all these Christian musics about, uh, lyrics about how, uh, you know, we want to see ourselves as God sees us. Well, here you go. Not many wise according to the flesh. And not many mighty. Not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world. <laughs> there you go. It's a bunch of fools. He's chosen it to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world. There you go. A bunch of fools, a bunch of weaklings. Why? Well, to put to shame the things that are mighty, the base things of the world. So if someone ever calls you base, say thank you. 
Uh, say That's biblical, actually. The base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. The things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? Why has God done this? Verse 29 tells us that no flesh should glory in his presence. His favor, so that he gets all the glory. A pleasant life is one that enjoys God's favor, but also gives him the glory, which leads to the second point. A pleasant life is one that is pleased to give credit to the Lord. I'm a, I'm a big sports fan. I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. Um, Arizona basketball is huge there. So recently there was the college basketball dunk contest. And so naturally I had to watch it. I um, mean, so there I am watching it. There's actually a Grand Canyon University a player who's also from Arizona. He wins it. He, he does this insane dunk. And afterwards he runs over to, to his bag. He grabs his Bible and he just points to it. And he says, read it, read it. And I was like, what? What am I watching, right? Like, this is incredible. Someone who sees God's favor in his life, and yet he chooses to give the credit to the Lord. What an incredible understanding. God blesses us with ability. God blesses us with talent. And yet we turn and give it to him. That is a life that that is pleasant. Number three, a pleasant life is one that understands that there is no better life to live than a life that listens and obeys God. A life that listens to and obeys God. Now, I've said it before, but at the end of my life, if, if someone emphatically proved to me that Christianity was wrong, which I don't think is going to happen, uh, but if that did happen, I wouldn't have regretted how I lived because of Christianity. Why? Because of Christianity, I enjoy a happy home. You see, because of Christianity, I enjoy a life that hasn't been destroyed because of sin. Because of Christianity, I enjoy a life that aims to be a blessing to others. Because of Christianity, I enjoy a life with no real deep-seated regrets. See, a pleasant life is one that understands there's no better life than a life of obedience. Fourthly and finally, a pleasant life is one that is pleasing to be around. Is pleasing to be around. And I hope that doesn't bring conviction to anyone hearing my voice. But just in case it does, we have to pause a moment and ponder the question, what does this mean when a Christian is living an unpleasant life? When a Christian isn't pleasant to be around at all. You see, guys, the truth is that there is no greater fool than the Christian fool. No greater fool. And and unfortunately, if you've spent any time in church like I have, you've seen a whole host of them. One who has access to wisdom, but chooses not to take it. It's kind of like starving to death in in a grocery store. It just (laughs) just doesn't make a lot of sense. The only reason for a Christian then to not have a pleasant life is by choice. Is by choice. We choose not to be. So so if you're someone who's perpetually grumpy, you know, uh, you you have like the, the grumpy frown constantly on you. You're always wondering, why does nobody want to sit by me at church? That's why. Um, just go look in the mirror, right? And if and if what you see back is this, that's why. Um it's, it's amazing. If you're the one who's always complaining about absolutely everything, that's why. That's why. And, and hear me out. That's by choice. You're a Christian. I, uh, <clears throat> back in the day uh, when, when I had a friend of mine who uh, was the, the head of a pro shop, I could golf for free. And so I golfed. I, I don't have that anymore, so, so I don't golf. Um, but back, back then I did. Um, and and I, was, uh, I was golfing with a friend of mine. And, you know, golf is just hitting the sphere. You're trying to hit it on shorter grass out there. Like that's literally it. it it's, you're using a stick and that's what you're trying to put the ball out there. And, and instead of putting it there, I put it there. Not there. There. And, and so what I do, I didn't throw my club. I broke it, right? I was just like, God, be kidding. No, I didn't actually, but I wanted to. In my heart, I murdered all of my clubs, okay? <laughs> and my friend, he, he looks out, he sees it, he goes, oh, man. Oh. At least your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but you get it. Next time you get cut off and you want to scream, lose it, you, you want to freak out, you want to explain to your wife while people just don't know how to drive here in Gulf Breeze. There it is. You remember. <laughs> At least your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You see, it's a choice. 
It's a choice. We, we can choose to live a pleasant life or we can choose the perpetual grumpies. See, pleasantness marks the way of wisdom and it's up to you and I to choose to walk down it or not. No greater fool than the Christian fool. Next, notice verse 17. It says, all her, that's wisdom, lady wisdom, um, all her paths are peace. So benefit number six, but for our context, benefit number two is peace. I want you to note that that very important word in the beginning, three-letter word, all. All her paths are peace. This means that if you choose to walk in the way of wisdom, no matter where you go, no matter what relationship you apply it to, no matter what situation you're facing, there is peace. There's peace. That means that there is peace, number one, in relationships. Peace in relationships. If you're walking in wisdom, you are choosing to live in obedience to the word of God. And the product of that is peace in relationships. You know that the word tells you that you are to consider others better than yourself. And if you've done this, you know the peace that comes from this divine mandate to honor others above yourself. Now, if you're married, you know that walking in wisdom is acting as God told you to act to both or to either your wife or your husband. And when you do, when you do, please listen carefully, there is as much peace as possible. I said it that way on purpose because I do a lot of marriage counseling, and, and you'll note that even in a marriage that there isn't peace, if you, as the person striving for peace, is doing everything you can to live according to peace, but they, your spouse, are not being peaceable, you will at least have peace between you and God. Again, in marriage counseling, it comes up time and time again, what if I treat my spouse well, but they don't respond well? What if they still continue to treat me harshly? Well, two observations. First, you are at least making peace possible, and that's all you've been asked to do. You're at least making it possible. By living peaceably with them, you're making it available to them. Second, because you're obeying the Lord and serving and treating your spouse biblically with no expectation of them, mind you, then you are at peace with God. Why? Because you're doing what he asked you to do. And if you're at peace with God, well, then you're resting in your trust in him. And there is nothing more peaceful than his rest. Second, and maybe, unfortunately, applied to that first example, if you have a, a rocky marriage, there's peace in rough times. That's what wisdom blesses us with. Not just peace in relationships, but peace in rough times. If you're walking in wisdom, again, you're living in obedience to the word. And if so, then you know exactly what the Bible says to do during difficult times. It's Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. What does it say? It says, rejoice in the Lord always. What was that last word? Always. Always. Right? In arguments, we say, never say always and never. Right? Paul goes, that's okay. I can use it here. Rejoice in the Lord always. That means if your marriage is bad, but you're a Christian, rejoice in the Lord. That means if you hit that little spherical uh, ball with dimples off to the right, a little too far, rejoice in the Lord always. If that jerk cuts you off in traffic, rejoice in the Lord always, always, always. No, pastor, you don't understand though. My life is so difficult. The doctor just gave me a, a terrible prognosis. Rejoice in the Lord always, is what Paul says. Always. And, and in case you missed it, he, his very next line is, again, I will say rejoice. It's as if he's cutting off the excuse, isn't it? Rejoice in the Lord always. Yeah, but no, no, no. Again, I say rejoice. And then verse 5, let your gentleness be known to all men. Why? Well, because the Lord's at hand. The Lord's watching. The Lord is present. Verse 6, a, a word that we need today. Be anxious for, what's that word? But rejoice in the Lord and be anxious for. Is that amazing? It, 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 the script is right there if we choose to live in it. He says, but in everything. <laughs> I mean, hear these words. Always, nothing, everything. By prayer and supplication, you can't miss this, with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. What an important thing to remember in prayer, no matter what you're going through. It could be the wor Today could be the worst day of your life. But in prayer, you can at least be thankful that you have a relationship with Christ. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Listen to this promise. If this is a promise according to the word of God and the peace of God, 
which does what? Surpasses all understanding. That example with Brenda and the doctor. Brenda, I think something's wrong with you. I, I think you're outside of your mind. It surpasses all understanding, the peace that she has. It will do what? It will guard your heart and your minds. What do we need guarded during anxiety? Our heart, the seat of emotion, where we feel things, and our minds, where our minds begin to wander because of anxiety. God says, I will put a century in front of both your heart and your mind. Through what? Through Christ Jesus. In case, in, in case you're wondering of the power, it's through his power. Well, third, not only peace in, in relationships and peace in rough times, but number three, peace in righteousness. What do I mean? No matter the pressure that you feel from those around you or from the world in general, you have peace in doing the right thing. Peace in doing the biblical thing. Peace in doing the God-honoring thing. And so you rest in the fact that you trust God and you've resigned yourself to simply obey his word. You say, this is my authority and I put it above me and I rest in that. I rest in doing whatever it says. I don't debate it. I just simply do it. Peace, if you like, in the fact that things are simply settled. The decision's been made. This is how I'm going to live. There's a guy who was visiting our church. He was on vacation and he told his, his son that he was going to go to church. And his son goes, Dad, you're on vacation. Why are you going to church? And he said to him, Son, 30 years ago, I made the decision to go to church today. Did you get that? 30 years ago, I made the decision to go to church today. Now, what he's essentially saying is that I resolved in my mind to be a man who goes to church, even on vacation. I, I settled the decision way back then. Now, he wasn't going to be talked out of it because he knew it was God's will. Now, this obviously applies to things beyond church. We could say 30 years ago, I decided that I'm going to serve my wife today. 30 years ago, I decided to refuse to complain today. 30 years ago, I decided that today I'm going to serve. Now, if you're under 30, okay, haha, funny, I get it. You, whatever, go back to whatever time you want, okay? See, guys, there's a peace that comes from a settled decision with no debate. It's so nice to just say, this is what I do. This is, this is my authority. It's settled. This is what I'm going to listen to. All right, we go on. Verse 18 goes on to say, She, that's wisdom, is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. Notice this, and happy are all who retain her. Back up to verse 13, we see that happiness is the first blessing that's listed for those who have wisdom. But now he says, happy are all who retain her which obviously indicates that we can lose wisdom. And so therefore, we must be very vigilant in our pursuit of wisdom. It's not, well, if you get it once, well, you got it for life, right? No, we, we, we can simply choose to stop walking in the way of wisdom, to pursue our flesh, to, to just grow weary of doing good. This is something we must be vigilant towards, and it constantly produces. We go on verses 19 and 20. It says, the Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. Is it not amazing that the thing that is made available to us as believers, the thing that Proverbs tells us is standing on the street corner calling out to us is the very thing that God used to create the heavens and the earth. Amazing. We have access to that by living according to the word goes on. We find our seventh benefit, or for our context, our third, verses 21 through 23. My son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep it right in front of you. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then, here it is, you will walk safely in your way, and your foot will not stumble. Benefit number seven Safety. Safety. Now, there's so much safety in a life of wisdom, but perhaps this is best seen by by analyzing the opposite, by looking at the contrast. If we look at examples of those who fell into danger because they neglected wisdom. Now, there is no better example of this than, than King David, right? A man after God's own heart, a man after God's own heart, a man who knew better. There he is. It tells us in, in 2 Samuel, when kings go to war, David stayed back. What does it say he's doing? It says in the late afternoon, he was taking a nap. Late afternoon would be around six o'clock. What are you doing, David, 
taking a nap at six when you, when you have the world to run. Now, what's more, it, it, he's not only where he shouldn't be, but then he goes up on top of the roof to walk around. Now, I, I believe, and I'm adding a little to this, but I believe that he was walking around in pride. Walking around, looking at his vast kingdom that he had created. His vast kingdom that he had sustained. His vast kingdom that he had got back on the rails after Saul derailed it. And there he is, he looks out and he sees, I mean, it's, it's an unfortunate play on words in English, but there is Bathsheba taking a bath. I mean, it's just right there though. Um, and he looks out. Now listen, the look wasn't the sin. The lingering look was the sin. Now what did David do? He had the option right there. Am I going to choose the way of wisdom or am I going to choose the way of the flesh? And so David very foolishly inquires of her. What, what do you need to inquire, David? That's, that, that is a nude woman that's not your wife, right? Like there's no questions that need to be asked. All you have to do is look the other way. That is it. He's like, oh, no, no, no. I'm just curious. Like, <laughs> David, you're an idiot. Like, I don't, I don't know how else to say this. And so, so fortunately, there are those who are wise enough to speak the truth to David. They say, David, that's Bathsheba. You'll note that you're not married to a woman with that name, okay? <laughs> but that's Bathsheba, the, the wife of Uriah. Now, understand that in hearing the wife of, that's enough, right? In hearing the name Uriah, a lot of things should have come to his mind. Number one, Uriah made it on David's list of mighty men. 37 of them. Uriah was one of them. In the last one mentioned. So he is a mighty man of valor. What's more is, is Bathsheba um, was the granddaughter of Ahithophel. If you've read through the account, you know who Ahithophel is. He was David's chief advisor. He was the advisor who, when, when Absalom was, was trying to usurp David, that he went with Absalom. He, because of this, began to hate David. David would have said, that's my chief counselor's granddaughter, and that is the wife of a mighty man of valor. And yet, because David was not choosing to walk in the way of wisdom, all David heard was, wait, so her husband's gone? Her husband's at war? So, no one will know. I'll just call for her and bring her in. I just want to talk to her. I'm just curious. I just want to see how she's doing with her husband gone. That's all. And you guys know the story. He, he calls for her. He sleeps with her. And then he sends her on her way. Did what he wanted to do. Well, then a few months later or a few weeks later, whatever it is, my pulpit, you can hear that. There you go. There's a knock on the door. Hey, David, um, Bathsheba. Who's Bathsheba? It's that woman, remember, that you inquired of? No, I don't remember. Well, we'll bring her in. Hey, David, I'm pregnant. So what does David do? You guys know the story. David tries to get the cover-up going, right? Well, I'll call Uriah back home. I'll have him uh, go sleep with his wife and then be like, hey, congratulations on your baby. That's going to be born in seven months right? Great. Well, he's a man of honor, so he doesn't do that. He's like, I can't go home and enjoy my wife if, if the men that I fight with are at war. Like, I'm not going to do it. And David's like, that's okay. Come back tomorrow. I'll get you drunk. So he brings him back, gets him, I mean, absolutely smashed. And he goes, hey, now, now go home and enjoy your wife. Even in his drunken stupor, Uriah had more wisdom than David in his sobriety. It's remarkable. He's like, all right, buddy, now that you're, you're good and wasted, go home. And he's like, no. <laughs> never, king, right? I'm going to lay down right here. That's what, that's what he does. <laughs> and so David's like, all right, well, then I guess I know what I'll do. I, I'm going to write his death warrant, give it to him to hand to the general to put him to the front of the battle. I trust this man that much that I will, I will give him his death warrant to deliver. And he does. David then thinks everything is fine. He brings in Bathsheba after Uriah dies, and he's the hero. Everyone goes, oh, what a great king. He brings in this poor widow. Oh, what an amazing king. And he's like, oh, good, man. I, I, I sidestepped all the dangers of sin. That's until Nathan shows up. And you guys know the story. Nathan calls him on the carpet, and David has to pay. There's no safety in living a life pursuing sin. 
There's only safety in the way of wisdom. Now, why is it so safe? Let me give you three reasons as to why. The way of wisdom is safe because it's full of candor. It's full of candor. Completely and totally honest. You see, the Lord always tells us the truth. What what Satan tries to hide, the Lord reveals. Satan sells with bright lights and marketing, but he hides the reality in the fine print. The Lord hides nothing. He puts forth the truth out there. There's no misdirection. There's only honesty. Now, you can note that Satan is so skilled to get our flesh to not listen to the Lord that that he spins the Lord's honesty and he calls it politically incorrect. He he calls it harsh. He even calls it foolish. And many within the church have even bought that hook, line, and sinker. Not only, though, is it full of candor, but number two, it's full of caution. It's safe because it's full of caution. We're told as as we honor the word of God to walk circumspectly in this life. And what that means is to walk as if there's landmines all out there that you can't see. You walk very carefully, believing that Satan can and will use anything. And then thirdly, it's safe because it's full of counselors, candor, caution, and counselors. One of the great benefits of the way of wisdom is that that the whole path is strewn with counselors. And over and over again, I, I have been so blessed to reach out to those who are far wiser than me to help me make decisions. Praise God. Uh, for those who have gone before us. This is why Proverbs eleven fourteen 14 says, where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. What a great benefit to wisdom. All right, fourthly and finally, we find in verses 24 through 26, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down, listen to this, and your sleep will be sweet. How good does that sound? Verse 25, do not be afraid of sudden terror nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Fourthly and finally, the last benefit of wisdom in this passage is security. When you know you are safe in the Lord, security is the result and the result of security is is soundness of sleep. Praise God. And yet there are many hearing my voice, there are many who are even using my voice right now, (laughs) me, who struggle with this very thing. Fortunately, um, I get to see the, the example of one who lives in security every single day, as I have never met a more secure person than my wife. It's remarkable. Um, I have yet to see her be afraid um, or anxious about anything. Um, And I'm not jealous. I'm envious. Um, But it wasn't that long ago um, I I was asked to to teach at uh, Calvary Chapel Vero Beach over on our coast. Um, And uh, Pastor Jim Gallagher is a near and dear friend. um, And so he asked me to come down on a Thursday night when they have their midweek. So I I drive down. It's three hours south. I drive back the same night. And so I usually get back home between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. whenever I go down there to teach. And uh, in, in our house... I'm the one who walks around, locks all the doors, makes sure everything is, is set before we go to bed, right? So like I'm checking every single door, I'm turning off lights, I'm just making sure of everything. Um, now, to be fair, I didn't say to my wife, hey, can you make sure all the doors are locked since I'm not going to be there? Um, so to be fair, right, it, it, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the blame, um, <clears throat> although it is definitely her fault. Um, <laughs> But I get back home around 1.30 in the morning, and, and what do I see? I see the door open. Now, I know, I know what you think when I say the door open is the door was unlocked, but that is not what I mean. I mean, our front door was ajar. Our front door was open. Like, it was, no latch. The door was open, guys, to our house, our front door. And I immediately... I mean, I'm a Christian, I'm mature, so, you know, I handled it very well. Um, <clears throat> no, I didn't. I freaked out. I, I, I ran inside. I get my, my flashlight out on my phone. I'm looking everywhere in this house because no doubt there's a robber, and if not a robber, certainly a murderer, right? So I'm checking the pulse of all my kids. Like, I mean, I'm doing all of the things. The next morning, I, I'm awake already, right? Because I didn't sleep very good the night before. My wife is just there. She's sound asleep, man. She is happy as a clam. She wakes up. I'm like, hey, good morning. (laughs) Yeah. How are you? How'd you sleep? She's like, I slept great. I'm like, yeah, I could tell. 
right? I go, did you know? Did you know that the front door was open last night? She goes, oh, really? I didn't lock it? I was like, no, no, sweetie. You can't lock it when it's open, right? I mean, like wide open. And she, and she goes like this, oh, whoops. And then later we're, we're and, and I have to say this so I can settle my mind, we're joking, although I think she was kind of serious. She's like, well, if it was my time to go, it was my time to go. I'm like, <laughs> Security, soundness of sleep. Yeah, I'll, I'll go for it. Um, first service is always, is always the best service, right? Um, so uh, recently I had, I had a procedure. Um, there, there was a little bit of a scare and, uh, we thought there was something going on. So I had this procedure to see if I had a, a, a growth. Um, and I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. Just know it was bad. It was possible they could find something bad. Okay. That's, that's what, that's what's going on. So go in, everyone who knows me is praying for me, all the things. Um, the, I, I get out of the procedure, the doctor is there and he goes, great news, nothing, everything looks good. Um, it must just be, you have symptoms of this and we'll figure it all out. I'm like, okay. I'm like, have you told my wife? And he's like, no, not yet. I was like, okay, don't say anything. <clears throat> so my wife comes in the room, I'm laying this way and I love to act. Um, unfortunately I can't act in front of my wife. She just sees right through me like that. It's the worst. Um, but, but there I am laying down and like, she comes right here and I like look over and like, oh, and she's like, hey, hey, how are you? I'm like, not good. And she's like, what, what's going on? And I'm telling you, I just came out of surgery. And she's like, what, what, what's going on? I was like, they found something. I got tears going, guys. Like, I mean, I'm like, whatever, whatever they gave me to put me under, like, I mean, it's still in the system. Like, let's go. I mean, I had tears coming. I'm like, they, they found something. I don't know how much time I have left. I mean, all the things. And she walks over to me and she goes, well, he'll be okay. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, it will be okay. I mean, and then I'm like, they didn't find anything. She's like, oh man, that's awesome. Great. I'm like, no, 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 no. They, we have just found something right now, me and you. Okay. And she later was like, no, the, the reason why is you have really good life insurance. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. She didn't say that. She didn't say that. I'm kidding. She said, I was trying to be strong because I knew it would be really hard for you to hear. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. you're making it worse. You're only making it worse. Soundness of sleep. Security. It's amazing when you have it. I can't wait to get it someday. <clears throat> But, you know, it's not just my wife, it's also Peter, and we end with this example. It's, uh, it's Acts chapter 12, verses 5 through 8. It was such a great story. Peter, it says, was therefore kept in prison. Why was he in prison? Well, because he was preaching the gospel. Now, now prison wasn't like it is now. He didn't have ESPN to check out. Like, there wasn't like a gym to, to go to. This was brutal conditions. Peter's therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Verse 6 and when Herod was about to bring him out, that night, Peter was what? Sleeping. <laughs> what would you be doing if the next day you're going to your death, your execution? The enemy is winning. Evil is triumphing over good. Peter is sound asleep. He's pulling a Betsy, acting like my wife. Notice. He's bound with two chains between two soldiers. That doesn't sound very comfortable, yet there he is asleep. And the guards were before the door, were keeping the prison. Verse 7, now behold. Anytime you read the word behold in the Bible, it's to, to do this. <laughs> and you go, <gasps> like behold, like this is a shocking thing that's about to happen. And now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by, by him, and a light shone in the prison. So get the scene. Right? There are the, the guards, there's Peter, and behold. Over in the corner, this big bright light shines, right? And maybe even like the, the hallelujah chorus in the background going on. Like the, the, the gates of heaven are spilling open. But anticlimactically, we read, and the light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up. Like he has this grand entrance, and Peter slept through it. Isn't it great? And behold, a light, and then he has to strike Peter like this. He's like, behold, Peter, I am here. Peter, and he, has, he kicks him. He has to kick him to wake him up. 
struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly! And I, I even add a little bit of frustration. And his chains fell off his hand, and the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. Like, I, I mean, there's not even an exclamation point anymore. He's just like, I'm done with you. <laughs> and so he did, and he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. Let's go. What, what, what is this? Security. It's security. Peter, walking in wisdom, is able to sleep the night before his execution. He sleeps through the grand entrance of an angel. Why? Because he's resting in God. He knows no matter what happens, the worst thing that can happen to me, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord. No matter what, the enemy is not going to win. He, I might die, but he's not going to win. I can go to sleep tonight. I can fall asleep right here and wake up in the presence of the Lord. I can even sleep through the presence of an angel. Security. Guys, I urge all of us in, in these uncertain days to choose, to choose, to walk in the ways of wisdom, to, to submit yourself to the word of God and experience all the benefits that come from it. Amen?